Hello, hello, hello. This is David DeHilster. Here I am every Saturday now. I've been doing this for a bunch of Saturdays. Um, if you've been expecting Franklin Hugh, he's been doing that for a couple of years. I'm uh, sitting in for him. He had to have some time off, folks. But I'm David DeHilster. I'm from the Dissident Science Channel. I'm also one of the directors of the Natural F John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. And today we're going to be having a great show. You don't want to go away. In my opinion, one of the great scientists of our time, of all times, in my, in my opinion. So stay tuned. <music> Yeah, that's me. That's me. And I, I uh, want to thank all my subscribers. Hey, keep going up there. Going to get to 3,500 here soon. I appreciate it. hope you're enjoying the new uh, format here with our interviews with some of the great scientists. In fact, I've interviewed him before, but it's been a long time and there's a lot of new people out there. And if you don't know Don, uh, Dr. Glenn Borkert's work, you're missing uh, something huge in science today. Well, it's, he influences a lot of us uh, who are doing uh, really amazing work out there. So you don't want to miss that. And of course, this is also broadcasting live to the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society, started in uh, the early 1990s as the NPA, Natural Philosophy Alliance. And in 2015, we changed our name. And we have uh, <coughs> cataloged almost 3,000 dissidents around the world in our database. And we have active, active members, over 300 active members. So um, anyways, let me uh, get in with the introduction that, so, and tell you what this is all about, of course. And this is our, sci our Saturday Science chat Chats, and it is sponsored by the Natural Philosophy uh, Society and also uh, YouTube, uh, Dissident Science YouTube channel. And again, we're broadcasting live to the, both of those channels right now. And I can see, again, people are already joining. Thank you so much. And um, let's keep going here. Uh, the mission of the CMPS is to be an organization that, above all, promotes critical thinking without malice, to be an organization that supports, publishes, and promotes serious scientific word, work outside the mainstream, to provide a forum for open debate about modern to uh, topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, that's today, it's really important, people, and mathematics, to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship, and more, really important to be run and controlled in its entire by paid membership, including the election and directory uh, directors uh, by, by its members. And it is member organization. And if you want to go, we have our new website. People are signing up. All, you know, it's brand new. A lot of our scientists are retired because they do. All, they can critically think any way they want without having to worry about putting a, a, a meal on the table. But anyways, we've got our brand new website. If you got to check it out. It's got a uh, uh, a new whole uh, look to it. It's got more of a feed of information about discussions going on in all areas and topics. And we have group and, and discussions and we have forums for all these areas. You can sign up and we have always great discussions going on there all the time. Um, works, works good on your phone, works good on your, your computer, but I encourage you to sign up. It is not anonymous. What we do require require in our on our website is that you use your real name with your real picture because uh, uh, <clears throat> this is re a place where real scientists with real ideas meet so we uh, don't allow people to come in and you know some weird avatar and not know who the heck they are so you do have to follow that one rule but we invite everybody and of course how, how can you participate you can sign up at naturalphilosophy.org you can just sign up there uh, you want to be, consider becoming a member. Memberships are annual. Uh, we have all the memberships solicited from $35 a year on up. And we have people who are retired and they're on a fixed income. But every little bit helps if you can spare $35. Uh, if everybody pays a little bit, we'll be able to uh, offset our expenses. The StreamYard, which we're using live to YouTube and Facebook, costs us so much a year. We have our website and it's being hosted. That costs so much a year. We have a software that we use now that's licensed that costs so much a year. It comes, comes up to a couple thousand dollars. So we greatly appreciate it, everybody, including the people who are always here. If, you, if you're always here and you're using this, please consider uh, helping out. It's greatly appreciated. 
and to defer the expenses. All this is volunteers. I get paid nothing for this. Oh, well, I do get paid. I get paid in the ability to talk to to some of the greatest minds on the planet, like Glenn Borkert, who tolerates me. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I I really that's what that's what I get out of it being around amazing and amazing people, including the members themselves. I mean, you can't get this anywhere, folks, and let people know. So you can participate in our community discussions on our website. You can also post news and happenings on social media. Folks, if you're someone from the old guard, those people out there who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s, because we have them all, uh, my father is watching today, he's in his 80s. Social media is where it's happening, folks. That's that's where you gain people. Um, that's where you we are we are gaining new people all the time to our uh, organization. That was one of the things the older members were saying. We're not getting new people. We are, and they're coming from social media. So get over it. That's where it's happening. That's where it's at. And uh, please post if you even have a, a Facebook page, whatever. Post let people know about us. Um, our websites, uh, for those people who are new, you can go to our community, naturalphilosophy.org. It's a wonderful, it's, called, it's based on Buddy Boss. Uh, we we uh, license that software. It's really great, um, super easy to use, um, very modern, and you can get in some amazing discussions. I get in there and I argue away all the time. Um, we have an online magazine. So if you're new to the area of dissident science or critical thinkers, we have an online mag magazine for critical thinkers. Uh, and it's at sciencewoke.org. Check it out. Um, we have over 50,000 views already um, and really great articles, easy to read. I know Glenn Borkert has some stuff on there. You can read about him and his work. We also have a Wikipedia, and it is uh, you can go to that at wiki.naturalphilosophy.org. And that Wikipedia is based on the um, uh, same software, MediaWiki, that Wikipedia itself is based on, and that's on our server. And we have over 10,000 pages. In fact, you can, again, read about Glenn Borkert there. He has a really nice biography. And if you have a biography on there and you don't like it, well, guess what? You can help out. Uh, that's a closed wiki. That means you can't go in and anybody can get out. You can imagine a Wikipedia full of people criticizing the Big Bang, relativity, and all that. If this was Wikipedia, it would be drummed out just like the uh, drummed out because Wikipedia, it, by definition, is the consensus. So obviously, by definition, it's not going to want to accept alternative views, and we do. And the reason we close it is because that's how we, we protect ourselves from people coming in and saying, no, you can't say the Big Bang is wrong, for instance. Uh, also coming, the Chappelle uh, University courses in natural philosophy. Now, I'd love Glenn to do this. We've already got a couple people lined up. James Maxwell is in there. We got also... Um, uh, my dad is writing one on the particle model, which uh, I've, which is stands on the shoulders of Glenn Borkert, and he didn't even know it. And I told me, well, I, I'll 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 tell you, I'll talk with that Glenn Glenn about that story. But my dad um, just naturally got into and understood Glenn Borkert's infinity. Um, <clears throat> So I always start out with some commentary. I like to do that to, to let people know. Again, this is I, I, I'm again welcoming. I'm opening this up and welcoming welcoming my dissident science YouTube subscribers. I really appreciate it. Thanks for subscribing if you're new. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy these uh, uh, interviews we're having. And uh, today, philosophy is really a lost art in science. I call it art, but it isn't really an art. It is uh, Philosophy is philosophy, obviously. It is very important. Um, it's something that a lot of people don't realize. They go, oh, what's a philosophy? You know? uh, and, well, you're going to find out a lot today. The importance of philosophy, well, before physics and cosmology, those words even existed, the word, you know, I, I'm, I'm in physics, I'm a physicist. That was not a word, not too long ago in the human history. And it was called natural philosophy. That is looking at the philosophy of nature, the rules of nature. And philosophy is really not discussed in physics and cosmology. <laughs> if they did, and if they read Glenn Borkert, they would soon discover the standard model spectacularly fails under the scrutiny of science scientific philosophy. And this is where Glenn Borkert, in my opinion, is one of the great, and not only uh, dissidents and critical thinkers of our time, but one of the great philo 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 philosophers of our time. And um, it, to me, you know, he's, he's already, he, 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 can, he can retire and just stay in, in Lake Tahoe and do nothing because he's already given the world amazing stuff. But 
we're going to pick his brain today. So Glenn, Glenn Borkert with, um, has identified 10 important assumptions in science. We're going to talk about those today. Uh, he's applied them to the standard model. And two of the things he just it blows away are p in the pillars of physics and cosmology uh, is the Big Bang and relativity. Yeah, no, nothing big, no, you know, nothing big at all. But of course, uh, we'll be we'll be talking more about that. And there are followers, and these are just some. And these people I consider to be pretty uh, uh, high level critical thinkers today. Stephen Bryan did a book on disrupting physics, and of course, that was very highly endorsed by uh, Dr. Glenn Borkert. George Coyne, if you didn't see, go back, go back. If you're in dissident science, look up dissident science, George Coyne, uh, Nofinity. Uh, and uh, he he has his book. He's got the second edition coming out. I'm, I'm helping him. Our organization is helping him publish that. It should be available soon on uh, Amazon and other places. And of course, D. Hilster and D. Hilster, uh, the particle model, we stand on Borkert's shoulders. Literally, my father and I would be, you know, shooting pool and uh, talking about uh, Michigan and Ohio State football if it wasn't with what wasn't for Glenn Borkert and his work, because we our our model wouldn't exist without it. Um, so as uh, one of my other favorite physicists, I'm going to get him to talk. If you haven't uh, heard about him, his name's Dr. Alexander Unziger. He's a physicist from Germany, and he has the kahunas to stand up against particle physics and all the like. And what he says, if you are people who are critical thinkers, and I want to, I want to encourage you because you're not coming to this channel only because you want to hear about critical thinkers of today. People outside the mainstream are pushing science forward, and they're always outside because the mainstream can't will always uh, push against it. Is keep on working, keep on working on your passion. Keep working on your passion. I'm, I'm a linguist. I should. Take, get rid of the on. Dave, I'm supposed to correct this, but keep working on your own passion, whatever that is, um, uh, and critical thinker. And we're here to help you do that. So that's the end of my uh, commentary. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to bring him up yet. He's probably sitting there, Dave, are you going to bring me up? But um, uh, I am. Uh, we're going to talk today about infinity. Actually, Glenn Borker will be talking another time. Uh, we already have a time set up this month. Later in the month, we're going to be talking about the Big Bang, because the Big Bang is a big bust, but um, Glenn Borkert has uh, is one of the great voices philosophically on that. So we're going to try to stick away, stay away from that so much today. But Dr. Glenn Borkert is a geologist and scientific philosopher, initially developing the Infinite Universe Theory, detailing its foundations in the 10 Assumptions of Science in 2004. In the Scientific Worldview 2007, Borkert introduced the universal Universal Mechanism of Evolution and Non-Neo-Mechanics, uh, 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 which adapts classical mechanics to infinity. Uh, Glenn provided the philosophical and uh, editorial uh, guidance for uh, the book uh, that was uh, actually on, um, I think, the Universal Cycle Theory. But he does have a website. Uh, actually, he's got, uh, uh, yeah, this is the website. Uh, he has a website and a blog. His blog is, I think, hosted on the Google platform. So it's been around a while. So you can go to science, science, scientificphilosophy.org, and you can read about uh, his Progressive Science Institute. And uh, his latest book, of course, is Infinity uh, Universe Theory. Um, if you want to know more about Glenn, you can go to uh, our Wikipedia um, at wiki.nationalphilosophy.org and just look up Glenn Borkert. He's got a really good um, history of who he is, what he's done. Um, and also, he is on our Science Woke uh, uh, or Science Woke Critical Mag, uh, the online science magazine for critical thinkers. He is on there as one of the featured scientists. And I'm going to read this in Glenn's own words. I think this is uh, interesting, uh, just to give you a, an example of what he has from his website. It says, I have over f 50 years of theoretical, experimental, and observational experience as a scientist, especially interested in, in scientific philosophy. Although I have produced over 480 scientific reports, including journal articles, chapters, books, and computer programs, the best by far is my book, The Scientific Worldview, Beyond uh, Newton and Einstein, Understanding the Universal Mechanism of Evolution, 
evolution uh, and evolution in the sense of the universe, not not uh, it, everything in the universe that evol is evolving. And that was published in 2007. Uh, it poses the ultimate challenge to the current widely popular, though absurd, claim that the universe is finite and that it exploded out of nothing. Uh, the book is completely logical from the beginning to end in support of an infinite universe and a scientific philosophy approach that will replace the Big Bang Theory and the system's philosophy supporting it. The challenge for me as, uh, is to get to get readers intelligent enough to and educated enough to handle the ideas presented and understand stand in the book's great significance. And, um, and that's very true. Uh, the paradigm uh, that I propose is antithetical to com uh, conventional physics and astronomy and cannot uh, and cannot be taken seriously by those who hold the idealism of mathematics to be the true test of reality. A, a detailed technical review of infinite universe theory was published by Stephen Putz, uh, Putz uh, and uh, who has also co-authored Universal Cycle Theory, uh, Cycle Theory and a follow-up book written by lay for the layperson, uh, just released Infinite U uh, Universe Theory. I'm going to show you his books. Um, uh, again, it's, I think it's very important to get this before we talk to him because um, we're going to be discussing and uh, uh, his 10 assumptions of science which are just absolutely astounding that was the first time i really met um him uh, i've got his book yeah, there you go those, those are harder to get these and he actually got a wrote something to me here 10 assumptions of science presents a logical coherent set of assumptions destined to define 20, 21st century scientific philosophy I will stand behind that 100%. I have I know I've known of this since 2004 and that is a true statement in my opinion and a lot of people's opinion. Glenn Borkard first explains why assumptions and not uh, absolutes are necessary for scientific thinking. By exploring the op opposition between deterministic and indeterministic views, he clearly shows how critical choices among underlying assumptions either clarify or muddle scientific uh uh what it is? Scientific. Oops, I'm going backwards. Okay, sorry about that. Um, scientific analysis. <laughs> I didn't read the last word. There we go. Um, all right. The second book um, in really his op opus, whatever you want to call it, is right here. I've got it. It's the scientific worldview. Uh, you should all get it and read it. It should be must reading for every philosopher and also every uh, science student on the planet. Presents a balanced theoretical perspective that has profound implications for social and physical sciences. Author Glenn Borker outlines philosophical alternatives to those necessary for cons consistent scientific and critical thinking. I should have put in there. And of course, there's another book. And actually, actually this is the book that gave me the, my aha moment with, with, with Borkert. Um, even though this book is really about what's called the universal cycle theory and was authored with Stephen Poets, um, I read the part that I really bought it more for Borkert and it blew my mind. I literally called him up. I think I read it in hours. I mean, uh, I read most of the book. I read it in a day, uh, most of the book. And his part, especially the parts about neomechanics and infinity and the levels of the universe, I just, it was one of the four, four moments in my scientific career that just blew my mind. So uh, I, I, I have a lot of, um, how do you say, um, Carinho, and I think, I think it's, I speak Portuguese, and I get, it comes out in the wrong land. I have a lot of affection or a lot of love for this book uh, personally because it really uh, exploded in my mind what Glenn was talking about. So it's still worth getting, even though it's it's uh, uh, half of it's about the universal cycle theory, which is a very interesting th uh, theory as well. Uh, it's very much worth. This book is worth. Uh, a buying. Infinity is crucial because it explains the extent and structure of the universe. We assume that the ma matter is infinitely divisible in the macro microscopic direction and infinitely integrable in the macroscopic direction. You know, my father and I use that. Um, we don't go as much in the macroscopic, but I, I never could say that to people. I always say it's turtles all the way down and turtles all the way up. <laughs> So he, he's great with words. Um, this guy, I'm a linguist, but he, I, I look like a chump next to Borkert. Um, we assume that time was, uh, time was infinite in the past and will be infinite in the future. 
greatly boarded. That is so great. This concept of infinity is unique, having never been employed in a model of the universe before. Absolutely, truly, truly. And now it's being employed in other models of the universe like ours. Um, it it, it re res uh, resolves many of the paradoxes and contradictions currently riddling physics and cosmology. That is an understatement of the century. Then, of course, he's, uh, his latest book came out in 2017, Easy Reading. Um, he sort of put it together. It's called The Infinite Universe Theory, uh, presents the ultimate alternative to the Big Bang Theory. We're not going to talk about this as much because we're going to have him back to talk about this book and um, the, uh, infinite, uh, uh, the Infinite Universe Theory. But I'll... I'll Excuse me. I'll keep reading here. Author Glenn Borkert starts with photos of the elderly universe, uh, galaxies at the observational edge of the universe. These contradicts the, contradict the current belief that the universe should be increasingly younger, ob, uh, have increasingly younger objects as we view greater distances. He, he restates the fundamental assumptions that must underline the new paradigm. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. Notably, by assuming infinity, he is able to adapt classical mechanics to neomechanics and its in, in, in its insistence that the phenomenon are strictly the result of matter in motion. He shows in detail how misinterpretations of relativity have aided current flights of fancy, more in tune with religion than science. Oh, okay. So I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to bring up our very special guest here um, to our uh, broadcast, and that is Dr. Glenn Borkert. And uh, welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dave, for having me on and all your work that you've done with CNPS. Uh, I really appreciate that. It's the kind of work I would have loved to do, but I had to do some philosophy. And uh, <laughs> that's, and, and, and you know what, what that is, uh, writing all these books and so on, uh, yeah. and al along with Steve Pitts and, and so on. And so, uh, yeah, when, you know, one of the problems that has been uh, – common in science is that, you know, I got a PhD, doctor of philosophy. I never had a course in philosophy ever. And you know why that is? The philosophy that is taught in most philosophy departments is religious. And in science, that's the opposite. So we don't find that very useful. And so that's what, uh, and now, of course, uh, if you look at the Big Bang folks and so on, uh, what mm -hmm. they're doing is using religious assumptions, essentially, and that's mm -hmm. why they get what they do. And that's why they, uh, they, they don't use any philosophy because uh, they don't know what it is. They don't know what the fundamental assumptions should be. And that's, of course, mm -hmm. what we did in 10 Assumptions. And once you uh, do that, you are on your way to changing the world and having uh, the last cosmological re revolution in hand. And uh, if you don't like the 10 Assumptions, that you know, you showed the book and so on. If you don't like those, make your own. Remember, they have to be consuponable, and I guess that's your next subject. Yeah, I got consuponable. In fact, I'm going to add this up here. Let me. Uh, uh, that that was my favorite, most un misunderstood word, and I. This is my now my favorite philosophical word. I mean, it sounds so amazing. And in fact, what's really what's very funny, uh, Glenn, is when I when I was making these slides. Um, you have, of course, PowerPoint, and PowerPoint has a dictionary of English words, quite quite extensive. One of the words it doesn't have is consuponability. <laughs> Why don't right. you tell us what consuponable means? What, oh, is, what does that mean? Yeah, that was invented in 1940 by Collingwood, and <clears throat> I was much influenced by his book, Essay on Metaphysics. Usually metaphysics is thought of as religious, but he did both the religious and the scientific uh, way of of studying metaphysics. And in metaphysics, what he claimed is that if you're gonna have more than one assumption, they uh, both have to be consuponable. Now, con means with and suponable means supposable. So if you're gonna suppose, uh, say, assumption A and then assumption B as well, they can't contradict each other. They have to be consuponable. Now, all 10 assumptions, if you'll note, uh, when you read the 10 assumptions of science, they all include infinity, and they're all consuponable with infinity. Now, if you have big bangers, they believe in a finite universe and a beginning and an end and so on for the universe, they cannot possibly use infinity. But of course, you have to remember that uh, Newton and all his followers used infinity. And uh, now we're changing over to realizing the universe is not finite. There's nothing finite anything anywhere. So. 
Uh, no two things are alike. No two people are alike, even identical twins. So that's what, what we're what we're talking about in the ten assumptions of science: consubstantiality. If you're going to have more than one assumption, it better not contradict your other assumptions. And that's the idea of consubstantiality. And it's not going to be in any any dictionary uh, because it contradicts it contradicts the idea uh, that uh, many people have that you can have different uh, assumptions that contradict each other. And this is very common. And this is oh, it is very common. Yeah, I mean, common. when when I hear when I hear people who are uh, talking about, um, for instance, uh, their own theories or their own ideas, right? Mm -hmm. You can hear them constantly. This is this is why I love love this word. You can hear them constantly. What they'll do is I'll have discussions, especially obviously if you're a dissident or a critical thinker and you you're going against mainstream, you get into conversations with people. But during those conversations, especially me, I'm a linguist, so I hang on every word and what a person's trying to mean with that saying that word. You you inevitably they they'll say X, and that's an assumption, right? And then they're talking wrong, and then they say Y. And you go, wait, 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 wait a minute. You you said X, and you know, well, no, you know, they're not related. And they are related. And I think that's you know, I, 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 how is it that when you, I mean, you weren't the one who came up with this word. Who was the first, where did you first see this Collingwood. word? Yeah, yeah. Collingwood, 1940. okay. Yeah. 1940. Now, yeah. now th that gets me to um, a question I have for you in general. Okay, you're a geologist by trade, right? Now, earth science, how, yeah. Earth, earth sciences. Okay, yeah. so why how did you get in philosophy? One of the things that struck me that I was really impressed with you is how you knew your philosophers. It's really funny. One of the things that we in the in critical thinker and dissidents world, whatever you want to call it, get criticized for is, oh, Glenn Bur Burkert, he just threw out all the philosophy and invented his own. How stupid is that? That's absolutely not true. When I talk with you, and when I've talked with you and have seen you've talked before, your stuff is based on, you, you've read so much philosophy. What, tell us how, who are the people who influ influenced you philosophically in, in, in your journey as a philosopher? Well, remember uh, this fellow, R.G. Collingwood, who talked about these uh, necessity to have assumptions uh, that are consubstantial, like you said. Now, there are some other requirements that he taught me, and one of them was that uh, assumptions always have an opposite. The fundamental ones do. You know, in science, we use thousands of assumptions, but the fundamental ones always have opposites, like materialism and immaterialism, causality, a causality. They're opposites, and the second thing is they cannot be proven. We say in science, all effects have causes, all right? Well, that's an assumption. That's a faith. We can't prove that. Every time we use that assumption, it works. It works trillions of times. But you cannot completely prove that because there are an infinite number of causes for even one effect. That's right. the problem. You can't do that. So. Yeah, so uh, I had a lot of um, experience uh, learning uh, from other philosophers. Um, you know, it's like Spinoza. Deterministic philosophers were my favorite because they they were using science. And the religious ones, like even Hegel, who is a dualist, uh, he came up with one of the assumptions I use. The you, matter uh, is always in motion. Uh, what is it? There can be no matter without motion, no motion without matter. Okay. Right. Right. That is so fundamental to science, oh, and 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 he, of course, uh, he thought there was uh, cause and effect, and you know, following from uh, Newton, and then um, and mechanically, and then he would talk about the spirit. Uh, that's his dualism. See, and this is very common among philosophers who got famous because religion, of course, was been very very popular for the. Right during the millennia. And so he was one of the fellows that really influenced me a lot. And then of course I read some of the offshoots from that. You can read Marx, Lenin, all of those cells were deterministic. They were not uh, spiritualists or anything like that. And then of course there were others that I saw as bad examples, you know, like Deepak uh, and uh, what is it, Sheldrake and so on. These folks that are trying to uh, put religion into science and say, well, they're compatible and so on. Though that's not what I'm about. What I'm about is strictly science. Right. That's why right. Our, we 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 call our our uh, site uh, scientificphilosophy.org. Well, that's that's uh, that's what we're about. It's amazing we could even get that 
you know, that domain. Uh, right. And, and, right. And so you know how hard it is to get a good domain. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. We picked that up early on. And so uh, in that website, we say we do not do politics or religion. So when right. I get, right. I, I get some people want to talk religion and politics, but I don't include them in the discussions because what we're trying to discuss is the offshoots of the 10 assumptions of science. That's the foundation of what I say is going to be the next scientific philosophy, the next, uh, like I say, infinite universe theory will be the next uh, cosmology. And it's right. all founded on these 10 assumptions. And uh, right. that's, that's what everything I do is, is founded on. Right, right. No, that that's 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 very. Uh, uh, it's very critical for people to, especially people who are new to our organization, to get uh, to understand the the philosophy is very important. The other the other thing you said too is you're interested in the scientific philosophy. <clears throat> it's not again. It's not bashing people's religious beliefs. It's just saying, look, science works this way, and we need to look at science in this manner. Now, I'm going to put uh, up here another word that I got from your uh, 10 assumptions of science here that you talk about. And you talk about metaphysics. Now, this is a loaded word, right? I mean, this is a word that um, I, I know you discuss here in the introduction of your 10 assumptions. I'm sure it's probably in the scientific world, world views as well. But uh, it's a two views of metaphysics. You say metaphysics is uh, sense one, metaphysics is nonsense. Sense two, metaphysics is the study of precepts of presuppositions. Maybe you can talk about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, what Collingwood had said, and he's right, he said that uh, metaphysics is what goes beyond physics. All right. So religious folks think there's some spirit or whatever that goes beyond religious. That's the nonsense part, I believe. And then the second is what goes beyond physics is more physics. I really like that because with an infinite universe, <laughs> Right. There's more physics, more physics. It just doesn't end, and uh, that's right. so. So that I still use the word metaphysics, although normally people think of it as nonsense or religious or or whatever, and therefore not useful. But I think uh, as scientists, we really need to know much more about philosophy, and not not all the correct philosophy. That's what I'm trying to push: is scientific philosophy, not having any religious miracles or anything like that. Right, right. Now, I'm going to do something now. I know this is going to break it up a little bit, but I keep forgetting. I make these really great intros for you guys, right? The people coming on. Yeah, and I didn't good. show it again. I, I, I have to put something on my screen that says, Dave, show the, the nice video intro. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a real a break real here, and I'm going to show you the impressive uh, little uh, introduction that should have been in the beginning. So bear with me for a few seconds here, it and we'll will. put that up. <laughs> I always forget that. I make them every week, and I don't throw it in there. They're very impressive uh, looking there. But uh, Well, that was great. You did a good job with the music and everything. <laughs> oh, well, wow. No, <laughs> th th actually, they have uh, services. You can do that, and you put them together, and the Internet's a different world yeah, today. Yeah, but it? and I'm learning. If, you know, I'm pretty far behind, but you're right up there getting this figured out. That's what I'm. That's what I'm supposed to do. So uh, yeah. anyway, so I, I thought that was interesting. The metaphysics, because it's something that if you're thinking, and especially if you're listening to you, if you're if people are a student of yours, they're going. the The words unfortunately have a lot of. Um, some of them have bad connotations. You know, when people say metaphysics, oh, it's that like you know I'm gonna drift off into another dimension and all that but what you're saying is that that word is still useful in the scientific philo philosophical sense but it's not the same meaning as the colloquial meeting right. right yeah just right. to tell you how how bad it is, is the situation was i was at the uc berkeley library i think uh on three occasions i came across this book of calling was his meta essay on metaphysics and i recommend everybody read that uh, and sort out the scientific part anyway. And I would uh, look at that and then I put it back on the shelf. I did that like three times. Finally, I said, hmm, let me look at this a little bit more. And 
golly, he was really good. Now he's an idealist philosopher, which is on the religious side, of course. And it, but he really had these wise uh, statements about how fundamentals always have opposites and how you can never prove them. You can't prove them a hundred percent. And, uh, that you have to choose between the, the different assumptions. And he called them presuppositions. In other words, you uh, everybody has presuppositions. When you walk across the floor, you have a presupposition that you're not going to fall through the floor, right? And if you recognize that and state it uh, verbally or write it down, then it becomes an assumption. And that's why the book is called The Ten Assumptions of Science, not The Ten Presuppositions of Science, because they're written down there. Now, you can study them. You can debate them. You can decide to choose the opposites, if you wish. Uh, they're there, though, and they're consuponable. Those are the ones that are. And so that's that's what he taught me. And so I, I remember metaphysics was a bad word. It had a lot of garbage. Uh, right, of course. You know, baggage on it. And I just, at first thought, well, this is more of the same, and I don't want to bother with it. And uh, sure enough, he was hit some really great points. Yeah, I mean, it's really one of the interesting things I've learned. I, I've been through that myself, is I've actually learned, I, I, especially in this organization, somebody may come up with a crazy idea, even, if, even non-consuponable ideas. But what I've found is when I would go to our our conferences or I have these I watch these interviews or have somebody on who has a totally, you know, different uh, idea of the way the universe works. Even like I said, even if it's not consuponable, I still it opens your eyes in some way. Right. You always can learn a lot if you if you take the time maybe to look at a different point of view where you think you're not going to find something. Right. So right. I, I think that's just an attitude people need to have. It's like a lot of times I'll, I'll, we'll have somebody on and yeah, there are ideas a little bit out there and they go, so why do, why, do, why do I need to spend time with this? Well, the reason you need to spend time, in my opinion, is people have thought about it. Like you said, they had philosophers who wrote books about it and they spent a lot of time on this. There's going to be something in there for you, whether or not it's, knowing everything in there is wrong and why i mean that could be one or it could be something like you said you pick up a book and say okay i'll read it and then all of a sudden you're going oh my gosh there is something there okay we're going to take another another word here which uh uh i know is a big uh it, this is really interesting for a lot of people oops there we go sorry about that deterministic now this whole idea that um the, the, that everything in the universe is, or, or we have free will and all that. Can you talk a little bit about what your your own personal philosophy? I know it's. Uh, I know uh, George Coyne has the same one. He actually talked about it in consciousness. That people want, you know, this whole idea of free will and everything. Uh, I know that sort of ties in what, what with we talk with Coyne. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, uh, determinism says there are causes for all effects. There are physical causes, essentially. Um, microcosm A, which is how I state things, and it interacts with microcosm B. So you have one thing hitting another, colliding with it. And according to Newton's law, that's what the cause of all events happens to be. And in the case of determinism, we say, well, there are causes for all effects. Now, free your, your will, whatever, also is physically caused. And has a law. Every person you know of it will have a long background that helps them decide what they decide. And you can't say you have free will because free will would be a causal. It would mean that there's no physical cause for what you just thought, but there is. That's our assumption. Remember, it's an assumption. You we can't prove that. You can always say, well, I have free will. I can walk across the room and not, and so on. And we all live that way. We live with that sort of illusion, or we kind of ignore it. We're not going to sit there and think, well, now this finger is doing that, and the causes are all. We don't do that, but we have to realize that theoretically, that's how the universe works. And if you don't believe that, then you have a problem because you can't understand it. You'll be all kinds of time, like you won't be able to understand the crazy things people do. And they often do crazy things, but you look at their backgrounds and sometimes they're horrific. They've been beaten as a child and so on and abused in various ways. And then you're wondering why they have this free will that causes them to do crimes. Come right. on, that's right. why, that, look at my background. I had wonderful parents. I never had any of that problems. 
Uh, I just, you know, had a wonderful time growing up. And so far, my life is just wonderful, too. So uh, I can't I can't really sympathize too much with somebody who has the criminal tendencies, but I understand where they're coming from. You see that? Yeah, too? yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I think that I have that feeling as well in the sense of just uh, people, you know, because we're always looking. At, it was curious to me because when you're growing up, you always see the big, good guy and the bad guy, the guy and the people in the black hats and the people in the white hats, right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, these are just bad people. They were born that way, but you you end up thinking. I mean, it's a it's a really a great experiment. Then I thought when as I got older, I said, okay, if I take two babies and I put them in this situation. And I put the other baby in this situation, then that yeah, that's a whole I, I you know nature and nurture. But there is a consequences to the things around you, and of course that's one of the things about philosophy and about your work that goes beyond just. I mean, it's it's part of science that that is as well. But I always now when I look at somebody, um, and you you know this has been many decades now. I'll look at somebody and there's some problem or they do something. They're always saying you know oh kill that guy or put him in jail or you know. And you think to yourself, wait a minute, you're a product of your environment. And that's one of the things that infinity uh, talks about is every, you're a product of all the infinite above and all the infinite below. So um, that, that, that's really interesting how philosophy jumps from science to you know, free will. And it's not easy. It's not easy for us to think that the reason I, I'm, I'm going to stop right here. The reason I just stopped is not because I have free will. It's because of all the other things that are going on in the, in the universe that uh, made me get the logic I have, put the logic in my brain, come up with the, these things and talk with you. All those things are the product of all the things, infinite things below and above. And I mean, it almost sounds metaphysical until if you really take it in a mechanical world, it's a very different. It's funny when I say those, my one side of my brain has an emotional side that, you know, uh, you're a product of everything around, you know, it's like, it's, it sounds, that's philosophical, but it doesn't sound scientific, but it's very scientific. And that's one of the things that you talk about uh, in your books. So let's go forward here. Uh, I've got more for us to talk about before we uh, uh, get into it. Um, we're going to take a look now at the, uh, whoops, wrong button. Sorry about this, folks. I got to put this up here. There we go. The nature of assumptions and the philosophical terms. So we're going to get into, um, I'm going to show these 10 assumptions of science. Um, and we, uh, you've already talked about some of them. And I think one of the interesting parts that you've already talked about is this um, opposites, right? I mean, you see all the... Uh, the deterministic assumptions versus indeterministic assumptions of the 10 assumptions of science. Um, and, and, and you say, this is the other thing that I think is great. It says, these are mine, right? These are Glenn Borkert's. Um, and I, I also asked you about 10. You know, it was 10. And uh, so um, again, you can see the two sides about what, um, how each one of these have um, uh, an opposite. Why don't we start with like number one, materialism and immaterialism. Let's talk about that. How, how talk about what, what that means, uh, what means to you in, in your, uh, 10 assumptions. Right. Well, materialism, uh, historically it always talked about the universe is uh, made out of matter and that's what we do in science. We are materialists because we work with matter things hitting things, you know, that's, that's it. So now immaterialism is the opposite. And it says, no, uh, actually, uh, what is like Chopra says, uh, you uh, are the center of the universe and your consciousness determines the universe. You remember, Barclay was a famous indeterministic philosopher who said, when I leave the room, the chair I sat on disappears. Why was that? Well, because he couldn't see it anymore. So that's the opposite. And uh, there are these elements all the time, like Sheldrake and Chopra. They are pushing immaterialism. And from that, then they accommodate uh, religion, which uh, in the case of Chopra has made him millions because he does alternative medicine and claims that uh, the universe uh, has been produced by his consciousness. And I, I hope he lives a long time because I want to see the universe for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think there's there's a whole world of philosophers out there that a lot of the 
you know, the average person doesn't know. Even, even the average person who's in a critical thinker doesn't really look at too much. Because I think, again, the materialism is where most uh, physics and cosmology tries to lie within, right? We, we, we think of the universe and we're trying to look at the, the matter and motion and matter. Tell, let's talk about that as well. You have um, this whole idea of what matter or motion is. And I think one of the interesting things uh, that uh, the most uh, we had on our database about 10 years ago, I had uh, people had the ability to go in and put their definitions in, which is really quite interesting, what they, what they think time is, what they think mass is, what they think uh, all those kinds of things are. And you had the most succinct definition for time. And what is your definition for time? It's one word, right? Yeah, motion. So it's motion. motion. Yeah, right. And it doesn't exist. It occurs. So, and it's not part of the universe. Only matter is part. Matter has X, Y, Z dimensions. So I am made of matter. I have X, Y, Z dimensions, but I'm not made of motion. I move as long as I'm still alive. I will be moving. When I'm dead, I won't be moving. And that's true of everything in the universe. When so time is. It is now. I was interesting that I forget who it uh, was who was saying. Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, George Coyne, who said, uh, well, you really should include uh, uh, matter. M time is the motion of matter. Because there are some people who think that there's motion without matter. And that's typical of modern physics, that there's motion without matter. And uh, that that is nonsensical. That's my fourth assumption, inseparability. There can be no matter without motion, no motion without matter. And of course, uh, many indeterministic physicists will actually think of motion uh, like, for example, when Einstein talk about, talked about fields, he didn't think of them as material. He, he, didn't, he went back and forth, and they still do that in physics. Are there well, particles still do that, yeah. In, yeah, are there particles in these fields or not? Or are they, are they just motion? Without, in other words, matterless right. motion. And we do have people still uh, trying to push the idea of matterless motion. That is motion without matter. And that's, that's contrary. That's an indeterministic assumption the opposite of inseparability, which is assumption number four. Right. Now, now when we're talking about, I, that's interesting that you said that George Coyne talked about, well, it, it's not just motion, it's motion of, of, of mass or matter, matter, I'm sorry. Right. And I think it's interesting that my father and I, when we talk about uh, time, it's, uh, you know, we, we talk about, well, it's sort of our invention of how we measure motion. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, it's our, our, our way of measuring motion. And yeah. the, here's a question for you, and it's, I think it's from my father. I'm not going to be able to take, take this, or maybe it was from one of our discussions. We have discussions like this all the time now that he lives in our, my house here, um, is that um, is, is time a human concept or is that we've come up and we need, or and the universe doesn't need it? Is it just motion in the universe and the time part is what we have put upon that? Remember, in all of science, there's two things that go on. There's the actual thing or motion, the thing that exists in, or the motion that occurs. What we do as physicists, we try to measure those. So when you measure time, you have to have a clock, right? Uh, if you have an hourglass or whatever you are measuring, or you can calculate the cyclicity, cyclicity of uh, the uh, earth, uh, and so on, going, you know, rotating and going around the sun. So those are our measurements. Time is motion. The dinosaurs didn't have measurements, but they certainly had time. 60 million years is a long time. So they did very well without any measurement at all. Other people think of time as an illusion. That's not mm -hmm. an illusion. Motion occurs, and if you think it's an illusion, then my, uh, it, then you're you're missing something because uh, time has caused you to lose hair and perhaps teeth and other such things, and there obviously <laughs> is some motion going on there, and so that is what time is. It's simply motion, and I don't know. Uh, my epitaph may have time is motion written on it because that seems to be really really hard for physicists who have been influenced by Einstein, who used time as a thing, as a dimension, right. And, right. And, and confused everyone. And uh, time is just simply motion. It doesn't exist. You can't grab a fistful of time and take it home with you. You can't do that. Yeah, and we should talk about another word here. Um, let me put this up here. 
Um, I, and this this sort of goes in with the um, uh, what, what you well what we're just talking about here. So let me put that up here, and that is space time. Now this isn't this isn't in the um, uh, in your well you talk about this. I think the interesting part about this is where does space time go wrong, and 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 I, that's. Let's put it this way. There's a lot of people that sort of have that same feeling who are critical thinkers. But you, Glenn Borkard, have really, because of your 10 assumptions of, and neomechanics and infinity, have really pinpointed where this goes wrong. Can you talk about where this goes wrong? Well, that, that's a good, good question. Uh, space time is a matter motion term. And matter motion terms uh, don't describe anything that exists or occurs because there are multiplications. An example is momentum. Momentum is P equals MV, mass times velocity. Now, do you have a pocket full of momentum you could give me? That'd be nice, just like not possible. So that's a calculation. There's no such thing as momentum. What there is, is things moving. And we are trying to, as physicists, we're trying to describe that. Space time, same thing. For example, I'm sitting at this uh, desk right now, uh, I'm in a certain space-time position. Tomorrow, I'll be sitting here again, and it'll be a different space-time position. It'll be the same space, same, but there'll be a different time. Motion, the Earth will have moved in the meantime, and so on. So uh, that's uh, the usefulness of space-time. As Einstein used it, he sort of was, and I've studied his stuff quite a bit. I think he's using it for ether. And uh, he remember, he dumped ether and said there was empty space. And the space time, uh, as used in the calculations of general relativity and so on, uh, is like, for example, you have curvature of uh, around the Earth or about around the sun or whatever. And of course, that's done by refraction. But also, he uh, considered it a, a bending or curvature of space time, you see. So whether it's uh, part of the corona or ether or whatever, the curvature around the sun is is a fact and it's been measured. And well, what is it? Is it space time? Is it due to space? No, it's not done, nothing to do with space time. It has to do with what is in that part of the corona, the atmosphere of the sun. So right. that's what that's about. And so space time has some use, like I said, you can use it to talk about your space in the space time position in the past and what it might be in the future, but there's no such thing as that. Just like there's no such thing as momentum or energy or force. These things don't exist. These are all calculations. They're just calculations. And physicists, right. you use it so often, you finally think, well, there are forces, there are forces. What are forces? Are they yeah, little they're magic not. hands? They're not. They're things, they're not. what they are is calculations of they're things definitely. moving. That's all yeah. they, they are. Yeah, there are definitely calculations. My dad talks about that too. We talk about it constantly. And you, you really, you, yeah. if you, you've got matter in motion. I think one of the things that is conf what went wrong too with space time is that you people took took it as uh, Einstein's theory of relativity is very um, sort of in the non Borkert way, sort of metaphysical. You know, tell tell us. Where where do you th where do you see that coming from? Where what was their logic? Because you're a philosopher, you can do much better than I can. What was their logic? I, I always explain it this way. I say, well, there's space, which is the place matter is moving, right? And um, time, which is motion, pretty much related to motion itself. You can't put those two things together and create a something. Um, well, why don't you? Why don't you give those people who are new to the philosophy and who've heard of space time, give us your explanation as as a the, a modern philosopher, where, what they did and what they did wrong with that, and why it it, it can't you know can't really be. Can well, you, does that make it sense? Has, it, look, you have to define what existence is. Now, my definition of existence is a thing that takes up XYZ portion of the universe. That's existence. So now I can't, that's matter, okay? I can't add time to a piece of matter. This is not, because time doesn't exist, it occurs. So I can take a bit of time and add it to matter. And I think that's what Einstein is trying to do. And uh, it's philosophically not correct. And uh, he, he's got away with it. And there's, and of course, four dimensions and so on. And, you need the four dimensions in order to 
to have the Big Bang. You can't have it without four-dimensional uh, space-time ideas. You have to have people who think that there could be four dimensions. You can do the math. That's, that's, that's not a problem. The big thing is, can you add motion or time? Now, all, all motions are time. Are you, are you going to add that to matter? Are you going to add yeah. that to the, You can't do that. And just, so, that's so part it. so part of it comes from I don't mean to interrupt yeah, just sort of because 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 I know I've heard you know I've talked with you and heard you talk a part of it comes from the idea that space time is linguistically because I'm a linguist space time is a noun a noun is a thing a person place or thing it's matter right right that's right. what that's what it is so the reason yeah. you started out with your explanation now and I'm just trying to maybe clarify with some people well, about matter is that space time they say is something it bends in fact you know i, I when uh, i remembered uh, when i went with dr uh, karazani when i was doing my film einstein wrong well we went to a, it was the year 2005 and they were worshiping einstein for his miracle year right well there's a guy there of course with the 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 proverbial you know um uh cone or what do they call it the sw a cone where you put the coin in and it goes around or the balls and they go this is you know this is um how space time works and gravity works well <laughs> dr karazani who is a brilliant mind he really uh, is a brilliant mind he he went up to the guy who's just the guy there who's a volunteer who likes science and he goes oh um, this here what is this and he goes what he says no this here he goes oh that's space time he says but what's if it's space time? What what's bending? And the guy starts to try to answer it and everything, and he gets really flu flu flustered. He gets so flustered that he goes, um, <clears throat> "Excuse me, everyone, I need to take a break." <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah. Whenever whenever we reach a contradiction, we have to take a break. You know, in science, <laughs> that's all, you're always finding new things. Your theory doesn't quite work, so then you have to go back through it again. And and I've had that many a time when you get epiphany, you get a, you get an actual uh, result uh, that you got by sleeping on it, maybe. <laughs> you know, right. so that that can happen. So, but I remember a philosopher that I was listening to. Oh my, what was his name? He 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 had a stutter problem, and whenever he came across a contradiction, somebody would ask him a question, he couldn't answer. He would start stuttering and mumbling more and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't hear what he was saying. And so that's what people do uh, when they have a contradiction. And I think that's great the way you show that. Yeah, I, it's another story like that. And I actually did, it was in one of my videos, those people who are my subscribers uh, to my YouTube channel. I do these, you know, sort of monologues with, you know, graphics and all that stuff. And one of, you know, I talk about the science evangelists out there because all they do really yeah, is they- they're they, great, they, yeah. Yeah, the, the, one, the one I like is where someone, he actually, to Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's not a scientist, he's, if you actually, if you go to the international database of movies, uh, he's an entertainer. That's what he really is. He <laughs> right. is. right. He's not a scientist anyway. Yeah. That's the guy, the guy, the one part I have in one of my videos and I play it over in slow motion and all that is they go. Yeah. So um, one of my readers uh, or one of my subscribers, uh, uh, Mr. Tyson says, asking me is if uh, when Einstein's relativity be wrong and or is, is it wrong? And when will it be accepted that it is wrong? His answer wasn't a philosophical one. It wasn't that, yeah, it's going to be wrong because, or actually no theory is right. It's just less wrong than right. the last one. He, he laughed because at that point, you know, he, the, he didn't even go, to, you know, you're, you know, when you're getting questions, normally you work your way up to the place where you don't have an answer and you start uh, stuttering or you go on your break. Well, <laughs> Tyson went directly to a laugh. He didn't even <laughs> he didn't even you know make make a statement about that. So yeah, um, yeah. But as an evangelist, he has to do that because that's yeah. the line, you know. And he's one of the biggest uh, Big Bang pushers uh, oh. in the world. And uh, he, he every every other word he says, Big Bang this and Big Bang that. And of course, the Big Bang, everything in the cosmos is interpreted in terms of the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe, right. which is hypothesized as well so that is what he's pushing and so yes. that you're right he's you're right to call him an evangelist because that's what he's doing he's a he's a hundred percent believer that's for sure and yeah. four dimensions doesn't bother him a bit 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. String theory, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm going to bring up another word that um, actually my father, I don't think he's here, but uh, he did want to, he wanted to, I'm going to relay that story to you. This is a word that really stuck in that my, my father, I said, what's the first thing you remember when you uh, met or heard uh, Dr. Borkert speak? Now, you know, my father is an absolute student of yours like I am. And our model will not exist without yours. It's only about matter in motion and for every force in the universe. It's a little different from yours, but only in a small way. But the infinity is definitely there. But this was the word, and I think this was the most overused word. There was two real overused words in um, uh, the dissident world, especially. Uh, one was field. The other one is this word. So maybe we can uh, take a look at this word. There it is, our famous word, uh, energy. And my father, you know, was listening and he really didn't think too much about it. But you were saying, well, energy is a concept. There's no real, there's nothing you can hand me. It's like momentum. It's, it's, it's a mathematical. And, and I, one, one of the things I tell people is, well, here's a clue that energy is a concept. What's the exact units of energy? Well, they change with every situation. So it's very useful concept, but why don't you talk a little bit about uh, energy? Because I hear that even in the in the um, I have the, you know the comments going on here. When we're done, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, comments and have people come on and talk with you or question you know give you some questions. Yeah. Talk about this one because this is a yeah. The uh, word energy is another matter motion term. In other words, if you do uh, the calculation e equals mc squared, uh, you're, you're multiplying matter, that's mass, times uh, velocity squared. So that is a, another example of a matter motion terms. And the way I say that in the book, I say matter dash motion. So there is no such thing. What it is, is essentially a word that is a result of a calculation. In this case, a concept calculation, same thing. And we use that all over the place and it's indispensable in physics. But you have to realize what it is. It is not a thing. I can't take a, a piece of energy and put it in my pocket. This is how I, I determine what, what is matter and what is motion. Uh, I can put a frog in my pocket, but I can't put jumping in my pocket. So if I want to talk about the energy involved in the frog, I might have the, the mass of the frog times the amount of uh, this or the distance that it uh, traveled, and then I could calculate perhaps the energy expended. And so that's what energy is about. Now, one place where you will notice this being very, very important, and I have written a paper on that, the physical uh, meaning of E equals mc squared. Now, what is commonly said is that mass turns into energy. Well, it, it, that's not possible because energy doesn't exist. So what happens? Well, what happens if you have fusion, uh, you may have uh, some motion that exits as well as matter from whatever uh, uh, fusion or fission, I should say, uh, whatever fission occurred. And what you'll have is uh, some emission of motion, but the motion of matter, right? That's why when you have that, the, the E equals MC squared, equation, people will say it turned into energy, which was what? Well, what it really is, is the motion outside that particular microcosm that has actually uh, fission. And that some of that uh, motion is transmitted to the environment. What's in the environment? That's where ether is required, because you have to have something to transfer that motion to. In all of the energy studies, that's what we do. We saw falling water, turbines moving, uh, moving this, moving that. That's all we're doing. We're making the calculations. And so we can't store uh, any energy in our pockets. It doesn't exist, but the uh, water exists, the turbines exist, and we can make calculations about what those effects are. And that's what energy is about. So that's why I say energy does not exist. And I think uh, most uh, conventional uh, physicists will say, oh yeah, it exists, it exists. Yeah, yeah, I, di I differ. 
and that's oh because, no yeah 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 yeah, and, yeah and, and when i try i guess what i do a lot of times when i'm talking with the average person who you know they find out that me and my my father and i are writing a book about the model of the entire universe and they people can't grasp that that's even possible you know if someone comes up to you and says that people won't believe you but when 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 they we start talking about it and you said well i'll give you some examples of how we uh, you know our current you know current science isn't working very well it's like energy energy isn't a real thing they go are you kidding energy blah 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 and i and 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 then what i do is i try to as a linguist i always look why does the word energy exist what do people really mean by energy and to me, I think what the colloquial meaning of energy is, is the idea of having something that can be transformed into motion, really. Right, right. If, right. If you, if you have, so the energy in your gas tank is a bunch of mass that you can transform into the motion of your vehicle, something useful. Yeah. So it's sort of a way to say that, oh, in here, in this volume, I have a, this motion. I mean, this, this, these ma this, this matter that's moving around and that I can manipulate it in such a way that I can get motion from that. And uh, I, I, I sort of look at it that way. That way, that way they don't feel so bad about like, well, then it doesn't matter because then, you know, a lot of times people say, well, we use that all the time. What does it mean? But I think a problem, too, is critical thinkers overuse that fields and energy. You hear that, you know, I think uh, my idea of the universe, it's made of all this energy and we're all part of that same energy, yeah, blah, blah, right, blah. Right. And that's what remember that the big bang theorists say that uh, there's dark energy. Yeah. And remember, energy yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and, and so what they call it dark because they can't see anything luminous connected with it. See, right. if you had dark matter that was an energy, then that'd be okay. But they don't associate dark matter with dark energy. Dark energy is this mysterious thing that causes this tremendous inflation that they required to have in the Big Bang, right? So then, therefore, uh, the energy is being used there. I think a lot of people think of energy as motion, which it is not. Right. It is right. not. It is right. a description of motion the motion of matter and that's what it is and you have to always realize that but i think a lot of people just think of energy as motion because you know i'm energetic right when i put my hands i'm moving my hands and i'm very energetic and so on and uh, they think of that uh energy displayed there uh, as um, motion but of course it, it's motion here right this is motion but it's not energy right and if right. i calculate what i just did i'll get the calories and so on Right, right. Well, well, let's let's get to infinity again. Oops, I got to do it from this slide on. Here we go. Um, <laughs> this is why I, I need a person who's doing this. You know, once once we get no, millions no, of those followers. are great. I'm glad you had these up here. This oh no, great. no, I know. Hey, listen, I I'm a student of yours for many years. So yeah, and, thanks and, so and, much. And, and, well, no, I mean the idea of, of having you on is um, just to let you know is that people. Uh, we have a lot of new people uh, joining our organization because uh -huh. of our work on, uh, you know, YouTube, on our website, um, on Facebook as well. And uh, these people don't know. I'll talk about Borkert and I sort of get blank stares, whereas, of course, the older guys in our universe, uh, guys and gals in our uh, organization know about you. So we're going to talk about these three words, which are um, uh, really, really important to infinity. And um, it, it, what I, I, I think I, I talked to you with about this, but and you would maybe dispute it, but I think I'm pretty sure I, I was the one who was trying to understand this. And it was like you always heard it's turtles all the way down, meaning, you know, what's the turtle? If the turtle, if the Earth's on a turtle's back, you know, what's the turtle standing on or the universe, right? This is the old yeah. philosophical. Yeah. And then, well, no, there's a turtle and, uh, below that. And, and they says, well, below that. And he said, well, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> well, then I took that same idea and said, well, it's turtles all the way up. And won't you explain to people, I mean, this is such an important um, um, concept. It's, it gives us the ability to, in the infinite universe, to talk about it in our local way right because in the end we are not you know we all carry infinity inside us and we're part of an, an infinity above us as well but um this really 
is a really wonderful, especially unicosm. I'm not sure. Were you, did you come up with that word? I didn't use it. It was univironment, but uh, let me oh, explain how that, how the micro and macro came about. Uh, remember, should I put, uh, should I change this to environment instead of uh, environment would be better, but you can change it later. Uh, unicosm. That's kind of interesting. Although, you know, it's sort of like a uh, universe that remember one of my, uh, beefs about the current cosmology, they talk about multiverses and so on. It doesn't make sense because there's a, what we talk about universe. That's one that that's what we have is universe. But in regard to these words, micro and macro, um, I, studied systems philosophy quite a bit. That's kind of like, uh, you know, just studying philosophers. And uh, what they do is they say, well, we have a system and uh, it, like you may have a car, for example, and that's a system. And uh, you study the whole thing and you, you ignore the environment because you can study the car without it moving or anything. And that's a microcosm. So I use, instead of using a system, I use microcosm. Instead of using thing, I use microcosm. And why is that? Because every microcosm in the universe has a macrocosm, that is an environment. So systems philosophers will admit that there is an environment around their systems, like your car. Uh, there's an environment, and if you drive it in the wrong way, you find out more about that. So the microcosm is a, a, a thing, and the macrocosm is everything around it. Now at first, uh, we, we try to figure out, well now, uh, what really happens, and a univironmental uh, analysis thing came about because I was with Elizabeth Patelke, a friend of mine, uh, and we tried to figure out what's a good word. There was, what was. Now, environmental determinism said that the environment determined what happens. Like it's old nature nurture thing. So they're saying, no, well, the nature is more important than the nurture. Well, actually, they're both equally important. See, so that's a univironment. I, we combine uni with environment. So a univironment is the microcosm and the macrocosm acting together to produce uh, univironmental determinism. So that means that whatever happens to a thing in the universe is determined by the within and without. And that's true of you and I. We are going to be influenced by the within and without. If you don't like your, for example, it, it, sociologically, it has some advantage. If you don't like your per, current uh, situation, change it. Change your environment. And guess what? You will change. That's why we go to college. That's why we learn. That's why we uh, do books and videos like this. That's what that's about. So that's the environmental Mechani that's the universal mechanism of evolution. And uh, that displaces and replaces neo-Darwinism. Remember, neo-Darwinism says there's two factors involved in evolution. The biology, that's genetics, and the environment, natural selection. And that's just a special case of environmental determinism. We weren't, see, being an earth scientist, I noticed that soils evolve. That's my specialty. Soils evolve. Rocks evolve, the planet evolves. But neo-Darwinism wasn't useful for that because there were no genes involved. So this univironmental determinism is the universal mechanism of evolution. I'm very proud of that because you don't go anywhere else with that. And the other thing was that at first when I just uh, gave the definition of environmental determinism, uh, I forgot to put in infinity. So it's the infinite number of things inside and infinity outside. That's where the infinite universe theory comes about. Simply growing up from the universe. You know, all of us do that. We think along certain uh, paths and then this is how you get, you go from microcosm to macrocosm and it says, oh wow, is that finite out there? Is there ever a microcosm without a macrocosm? Like the big bangers say, they say, well, you have this finite universe and it's, and there is hypothesizing that it exists by itself. It doesn't. It can't. That, it, that it, but again, these are always assumptions. We're assuming there's an infinity and that there's always something outside of everything. And uh, that's, that's where those words came from. And, that's, and I hope everybody can understand that the uni part, uh, univironment. And you'll have to take a look at that and, and study that. Because whenever you study something, Univironment is really okay. Uni, uni environment. So yeah, uh, I would put in 
uni environment and knockout. Well, you have microcosm, macrocosm, and uni environment, and that that would be the. Yeah, I was trying to be cute here, and I think that, that was <laughs> yeah, fun. microcosm, macrocosm, and uni environment. Whoop, there you go. Wow, it's great. You can do that. Macrocosm and yeah, then and uni then, and uni and then just environment. Knockout environment. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be good. Okay. Back off and uni viron and uni viron. We got it. Yes, in environment, it's environment with the you know the uni just combining the microcosm and the macrocosm, and I think it's wonderful. It, it tells you it all is. you need to know about infinity, really. So it like is. You're saying, you know, you know, microcosm. There, you have, like Aristotle said, you can uh, divide uh, matter up infinitely. So, and he, so he, he didn't think that the universe, the macrocosm, was uh, that way. Uh, it turns out Newton thought. The macrocosm was infinite, but that the microcosm was finite, and so and the reason he said the macrocosm was uh, infinite because he said, well, if everything in the universe attracted everything else, it would all come into one big lump, and uh, that isn't what we see. So therefore, it must be infinite. So that's how. So those two guys had the micro and the macro separate, but I just combined them. Yeah, I mean. Uh... Boy, this controls. I'm sorry. People are going to get seasick with my uh, controlling the um, in the my, my uni environment here is not going so well. <laughs> the uni environment is not working out. That's okay. I think I, here's here's one of the things that I really really like about uh, the infinite universe, infinity, is one of the things we're always talking about is this idea of. I, I think the thing that bothers me about the um, uh, multiverses. Or there are parallel universes, right? The thing mm -hmm. that bothered me was, where are they? I mean, where are they located? And people say they're just in another dimension. That never flew with me. But then when infinity came along, I thought, wow, there are an infinite amount of, of unicosms, right? And those, those themselves... Uh, you can almost think of, you know, inside me, who knows? It just goes down and down and down. There's probably whole, you know, planets with people running around. Ah, who knows? <laughs> don't know about that, but... Yeah, what, I don't know. I, I, I we know don't know. That would, we can't, we don't know. We can't other say. Other but what yeah. I'm saying is, regardless of whatever it is, I'm, I'm just making it to make it so people right. can visualize it, right? Whatever it is, uh, I'm holding within myself all these you know, worlds, more or less, if you look again at the at a not an infinite level, but a sort of a local level. But everything has a place. Right. Yeah. You're not you're not occupying a space somewhere where, um, you know, there are two people in your place. Right. It's always like the, the problem with the transporter in Star Trek. Right. Yeah, if I yeah. transport you both to the same coordinates, what's going to happen? I don't know. Do they. You explode. I don't know what's going to happen, but the whole, the whole, I, I think the infinity part that I like about it intuitively sort of, and I've gotten a feel for is that, yeah, there's all these, these things that are, can be really complex and very, you know, lots of mo movement going on, but you know, there's, there is nothing happening in some other dimension. It's all, it's got its own place. And if, if yeah. there are other planets and beings inside it levels way, way, way down, they have its place and it's not in the way of something else going on yeah. in, in the universe. So, yeah, it's like uh, what uh, happened is that Kashlinsky and his gang uh, found that galaxies were tending to move in a certain preferential direction in the observed universe. And so what that implied is that there was a huge mass outside of the observed universe. That's how, if you look at our uh, universal uh, cycle theory book. We have a, a picture of the universe there, and I can actually show what that means. Maybe some people don't understand this. I don't know if you can see this, uh, uh, but you know, backwards or not, uh, yeah, let me, you, let me, you, you, you can see that little red dot. That's yeah. what we call it, the observed universe. And look what's in the center of it. Yet another part of a huge vortex that we're part of. Uh, I don't think we can say that's anything but speculative, but it, you can see this huge mass outside the current observed universe. And this is where they get the idea, well, maybe there are multiverses. Well, that's not a multiverse. It's just another part of the universe. It's just 
pretty big and it, you know it affects the gravitation but uh it's not a multiverse and so we just the, the universe is there's a reason we use uni and that means one right let's, right let's keep it right. together let's right. keep it together I say that all the time. Uh, I say the reason universe actually exists in almost every human language, and its intention by people is to mean everything. It's to mean everything. It's not to mean. It's not to be meant to be a unit environment or some part of a macrocosm or part of the micro. Mac Just everything. Micro. It's it's everything. That's why we have it. But because we have language, we have the privilege to make anything into anything. Then we can just say it. And unfortunately, a lot of people who are working on their own theories and ideas, in my opinion, are using language without thinking about the scientific consequences of that. Yeah. So the interesting thing about language is, uh, remember we talk about matter and motion. Every language has a noun and a verb in it, in, a, in the sentence. So uh, noun is for the thing and the verb is for what it did, the motion that right. that thing did. And that's in every language. It's right. fundamental. And you can't divorce matter from motion. You're not gonna say, well, Dave moved across the room, but uh, and, and and kind of divorce that from you. I could say moved across the room. What was it that moved across? Matterless motion moved across the room. This is not possible. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, let's see here. If I got some more here, I'm looking at. Oops, end of slideshow. All right. So, um, why don't we uh, go through and um, the ten assumptions of science? We're going to just go through and maybe you can just talk briefly about each one um, because it's part of the it's part of your work this foundation that is again assumptions are those things that you cannot prove you just have to accept so these are the assumptions and maybe if you can go through each one of them i'll put them on screen here uh, so you can see them and go through those and just talk about them one at a time if we've already talked to them you can sort of briefly go uh, yeah. you know past yeah. that well, again materialism we say that the universe is uh, consists of matter and then others say well really it's immaterialism is produced by consciousness or something like that and then causality uh, is the opposite of a causality now i give a different definition of causality uh that uh, essentially causality uh in my definition is that any uh, effect will have an infinite number of causes. What does that mean? Well, infinite, you can't determine every single one of those factors. It'll always be a plus or minus. And that goes into the uncertainty thing. Remember certainty was an, in certainty was one of the uh, uh, assumptions that the uh, quantum mechanics folks use. So they have, causes a b c and then they'll have d or something as probability and why do they do that well because there's always a plus or minus no matter what measurement you do in science always a plus or minus and that's where the uncertainty assumption comes in and it says this it says uh, we can never know everything about anything but we can always know more about anything you see how infinity fits in there and likewise into the Causality assumption. Causality says there's an infinite number of causes for anything. Uh, that's where we use the infinite. Now, you, uncertainty then uh, tells us that we're always going to have a plus or minus in any actual measurement. Then there are no constants in nature. Sorry to say this, but the light is not constant. It's really, really quite precise. How in most environments, uh, unless you get into water when it's 225 instead of 300 uh, million meters per second. Then there's inseparability. Uh, that was no matter without motion, no motion without matter. And again, indeterminists think of the separation of this. And what an example is what is called, uh, what is it, disincarnation. Uh, the spirit can be separated from the body. So religious people use separability in that way so that they say, okay, we, we have this, this wonderful energy that I'm displaying now. That can be, uh, when that's, where did he go when he dies? Where does that energy go? That's the separability. They separate matter uh, from motion and uh, the body is buried and then the motion goes off, who knows where. So conservation, of course, it says that matter and the motion of matter can neither be created nor dis, uh, destroyed. And that's the opposite of uh, creation. Creation says, no, you can create something out of nothing. 
And that's, we disagree with that. That's not scientific. Conservation is scientific. Usually it says conservation is the conservation of energy. Well, I object to that and dump that. And I say conservation is that matter and motion of matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, number six is complementarity. Uh, what that is, it's a little complicated. Most people don't know much about the second law of thermodynamics. But the second law says an isolated system will always have, uh, can only have increasing entropy, disorder. And the opposite is never mentioned because this complementarity uh, is used in an isolated situation. It's a system theory. There's no environment involved. But non-complementarity says that you have actually uh, things not things coming toward. See, in complementarity, uh, you're getting uh, a system is coming apart. Like you and I, I, I'm coming apart more than others, losing hair and such. And so that's what happens to everything in the universe. It comes together at one point and then it comes apart. And where do those parts go? Well, non-complementarity says, look, it, it goes somewhere else. And that, in other words, in one case, this is a departure, complementary, and non-complementarity is a, um, a, uh, uh, a coming together. So you have, uh, it's dialectical. In other words, things go away and they go toward. And that's true in an infinite universe. Uh, it's not true in a finite universe. The finite universe, they talk about the heat death, remember, of the universe. And that's assuming there's no outside, no, no macrocosm. And so what happens, they say, well, it had a beginning and now it'll have an end. And that's typical of a finite system. Irreversibility, that just simply says that uh, even if you do an experiment in a lab, uh, you turn you know pH high or low and you can do that and, and change colors and so on. And that's still not reversible because you in the meantime and the rest of their uh, universe has been in motion. And so every single action that occurs in the universe is uh, irreversible and has always been forever. Reversibility says, well, now we can actually uh, turn things back and we might be able to go back in time or something like that, which is all ridiculous to anybody who knows science. It's a, it's a science fiction thing. It's very fun to play, but it's not going to happen. So infinity again, uh, infinite in the micro and the macro. And then infinity is uh, obviously one or the other, both, usually both. Uh, most people who are, if they think about it, they will realize that if you're, if you're really going to get into infinity and you're going to have the Big Bang as your guiding uh, theory, then you also have to have a uh, finite particle theory. Finite particle theory says there is a particle that it, it cons everything in the universe it consists of and that it's finite. There's uh, essentially nothing inside of it. And of course, it wouldn't fit Einstein's, e not it wasn't Einstein, Maxwell's 1862 equation e equals mc squared. Uh, it wouldn't fit that. And so consequently, that would be a violation of, of even relativity. And relativism and absolutism are interesting in that relativism says that everything in the universe is similar to every other thing in some ways and dissimilar in some other ways. Now, absolutism has the uh, other assumption says that there may be two things in the universe that are identical. And one example is uh, snowflakes. And I got into it on Wikipedia where I tried to say uh, that there were an infinite number of possible snowflakes. And this other fellow was saying, no, there's a 10 to the 125 or some darn thing, which he calculated uh, and uh, said that, no, it was finite and we, we know what it is. No, it's not true. So. Uh, relativism is uh, really important in certain cases. And uh, one example is uh, people say, well, uh, if, there, if the universe is infinite, there'll be another galaxy where a person just like me exists. Exactly like me. I think you were kind of talking about that a little bit. And uh, uh, that's one misconception. That is based on absolutism, you know, the possibility of identities. And uh, that's not possible. And that's, uh, so we use relativism. And then the 10th one is interconnection. And that simply says that between any two things is matter capable of transmitting motion between those two things in the universe at infinitum. And disconnection says, no, um, there could be empty space between any two things. And 
I disagree with that. I don't think there's any such thing as empty space. And of course, that's where Einstein came in the door and he rejected it eventually in 1920 when he said, oh yeah, there's probably ether, but uh, yada yada doesn't fit his idea of uh, what ether should be. And uh, so this connection is common. People just think we have ma matter and then we have uh, no matter, but that's not true. And the way that it goes is this, uh, there's a uh, idealization between solid matter and empty space. You know, solid matter is one ideal and empty space is another. Neither of these exist. Idealizations are ideas. They don't exist. Everything in between exists. So everything shows some, like if you look at the atom, you'll see that it's 90% uh, empty space, quote, because it's not really, but uh, then uh, it has some matter in it. So and some people say, well, if you did this disconnection or this interconnection completely, you'd have a block universe, a universe that is solid matter. That's not true because whenever you do as Aristotle said, every time you split some piece of matter, you're gonna find two things, two idealistic things. You're gonna find some uh, empty space and some matter. So if you continue to do that, you don't end up with solid matter, even within something in between every two things, it doesn't happen. What you have is a little bit of matter more, you split it in two parts, you have matter and uh, empty space, matter and empty space, they're idealizations. They help us um, to understand. For example, uh, you have a doorway and you can walk through that doorway, it has empty space, right? Well, we all know there's nitrogen there, oxygen. That's not true. So space just is weaker parts of the universe that allow the stronger parts to move through. That's all that is. Yeah, no, thank you so much for going through all those. Those uh, they generate a lot of uh, comments and we do have people in what I call the green room here. So um, what I'm gonna do is usually I go through uh, some of the, uh, I'll be going through some of the comments. Uh, this one of course is from somebody, uh, my father who actually follows you. So I figure I'd, I'd put this up here, he says, my main assumption is that the universe is made of objects that move. To, do, to, to disprove it, find one object that, that does not move. One might find one at, at one point in time, but the imbalance of the universe will cause it, cause it uh, to move. So uh, I think, I think he's, this seems to be an understanding of what you are saying about matter in motion and every, all matters in motion. Actually, uh, the thing that you adopted from one of the philosophers before you, right? That, that yeah, well, Einstein that. had that. He was always talking that you had to know what your motion was in order to, to know uh, anything about the universe. Everything was in motion, according to him. And if you study anything that you think is not in motion, you will find that, yep, uh, that's why I use a environment, because the thing itself might seem to be uh, perfectly right. motionless, right. like, that I might be motionless, but not really, because there's all kinds of stuff inside me that's moving and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff outside that's moving. And if you use both the microcosm and macrocosm, you won't have any, any you'll have, have a better understand of what we're saying about the whole universe being in motion. Right. Okay, I have people in the green room. Um, if you are a person I want to come up and talk with or discuss or ask a question to uh, Glenn, you can wave at me there. Um, I know I see Nick Percival's here and Ian's here, James Keene. If any of you people want to come up and talk directly, you can. If you also want to do that, um, you can do that. It, all you have to do to talk with us live is to go to live.naturalphilosophy.org. You come into our green room. We have room for 10 people right now. We have seven, so we do have some, some people and some uh, space available. Um, let me uh, go through these. Uh, uh, oh, oh I, I know one of the questions, uh, one of the things that are people are talking about is ether. And um, I, I know I'm not an etherist myself, but of course you can't have light. There's a couple of things about light in general, right? Ether is one solution, a solution that people have for light. We have another one. It's a waves and particles, okay, all traveling, you know, in the same direction. But the, one of the problems with modern science is it talks about it's it is the problem with Einstein, where you you have light but you don't have uh, it, it, there's no physicality to it. Can you explain a little bit? about the ether side of that. I'm going to be looking at some questions while you do that. Okay, the, one of the reasons uh, Einstein 
throughout ether was the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887. And what they did is they tried to measure uh, the ether that the earth was traveling through. And we know that the earth goes 30 kilometers per second around ether being stationary, which they assumed uh, would uh, actually have uh, then if the effect would be an ether wind and they were trying to measure that. Of course, that never was true. What they were trying to do, see what, what ether is actually entrained like the atmosphere of the earth. It's entrained around the earth. And so what they were trying to do is impossible. Uh, they, uh, it was sort of like if you were measuring the jet stream uh, in your basement or in your backyard, you're not going to get much. And uh, there's a jet stream, of course, and that's higher up. And so the ether measurements that they did in Cleveland were essentially very close to zero. They were, they were not zero. If you study it and study, especially if you study Bryant's work, you'll see that it was a little bit more. It wasn't 30 kilometers, though. The 30 kilometers was never achieved. Uh, the highest values were maybe 10 or, or so kilometers per second on uh, Mount Wilson. And uh, they, they did get that measurement. And uh, they, now Einstein debated it because, uh, remember, his whole theory depended on no ether. Uh, he believed the, the Michelson-Morley stuff. And uh, that was his hypothesis, his postulate. And uh, we've got lots of evidence. Sonyak is one example uh, of an experiment that shows uh, that, that there is ether. And uh, there's many other experiments that prove that. Uh, but they're interpreted from the point of view of Einstein and relativity. And so they will use, for example, in, in Senyak, they proved that ether, uh, that, that light was not a classic particle. A classic particle, of course, uh, the, its motion declines with distance. Like you throw a baseball, it slows down, right? So that's not what happened in Senyak's experiment. Senyak's experiment just said it's a medium by which the light motion is transferred. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, the, the uh, folks uh, in relativity uh, tried to excuse that. And Einstein excused it with, with eight ad hocs that were used to uh, essentially uh, talk about the, his uh, untired light theory. Now, remember, tired light theory was used by some people, including Hubble, to say that, well, the, the cosmological, the galactic redshift uh, was a uh, result of tired light. They didn't have a mechanism for that, so they, they, they got kicked out, and of course, in favor of Einstein. And he has this untired light theory, and so he's eight ad hocs. You know, an ad hoc is an add-on to a theory to save it. He's got eight right. of them. I, I list them <laughs> in the book, uh, Infinite Universe Theory. And uh, is really neat because you know, remember, it doesn't slow down. Yeah, and it it is a massless particle; it has nothing in it, and it travels through a massless environment. Macrocosm is a massless, and so it's really miraculous. <laughs> and and so anybody who studies these ad hocs kind of giggles about it. And uh, it's one reason to throw out Einstein's uh, his theory of light as a particle and. Uh, it's really just a wave. And right now we have in physics a wave particle duality because we know it has that that light involves collisions. Remember, he even got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect where there were collisions involved. What were those collisions of? They were of existing ether particles. Just like when you hear something, what is it? Particles from the atmosphere uh, hit your eardrum, right? And that's what, now, what is sound? Sound is, if Einstein was doing it, he would call sound being produced by soundons, particles that travel from, you know, yeah, from my mouth to your ear. Those are soundons, according to Einstein. But he never brought that up because it's so silly, because it's really just motion in the atmosphere and that's what it is. And light is the same way. And I know a lot of people still don't believe in ether, but I actually, you know, on in my infinite universe theory book, I calculated its mass. It is so tiny, 10 to the minus 47 grams. I calculated also that uh, it has, there are 10 to the 20 ether particles in an electron. Mm. Just think about how small that is. No wonder we haven't been able to detect it directly. And I'm not even sure we'll be able to do it directly. It's all by inference, by like through the Sanyak uh, uh, experiment and so on.
No. Well, there is. The only thing I will say on this side is that there is another. Uh, and my father in 2015 came up with a way to make waves, but it's not from one particle. So it's not a particle. That's the problem with photons. Photons, of course, Newton said they'd have to be different sizes to, you know, to to move to create frequency. But if you have waves of particles, of course, you can create any types of things. In fact, that's what we do in the digital world. So there is the idea that it's that that, for instance, Sinyak proves ether. It proves that there needs to be a physical medium. But there is a, I, I believe, a second way you can do that. But I think the most important thing is is that we need to understand that. You can't have, you know, stuff, for instance, going on forever. This idea that light just goes on and just continues to move forever because there's nothing in the way. That's what we think is happening with the Pioneer spacecraft, yeah, right? right? The right. Pioneer, it's, it's out in space. There's just nothing there. It will go. And if it doesn't hit anything, it's just going to go or till the end of the end of the universe, hit the end, edge of the universe and fall on the turtle's back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that, that's why one of the ad hocs, of course, is just this that light travels forever uh, right. and it, it is untired and you know right. everything in the universe gets tired like you and i and a car runs out of gas and you know baseball doesn't go forever why is that well because it's run it runs into something right right and, but he hypothesized essentially perpetual motion with his theory uh, of this particle you know now motion in a medium that that's different because uh, there is no perpetual motion involved there. But in the case of the particle, that's what it was. And so he was in the patent office. That was interesting. Had he applied for a patent for this process, he himself, when he was younger, would have thrown it out. Because automatically, right. if you say you've got a perpetual motion machine, eh, gone. They don't even look at it because they know that that's not possible because of the second law of thermodynamics. Right, right, right. So um, I'm going to take a look at, at a statement here. Um, it's um, let me get get this a little so we can see it a little bit better. I just want to it's, you know I, I know sort of what you would be saying about it. This is is the universe really expanding or is energy simply making more and more complex patterns through which light must pass? And again, I think one of the things about what uh, just looking at it, it's it's a mixing again of terminology. Uh, where you have, it's not consupanable, right? I mean, this kind of statement. Yeah, is the universe expanding? Remember, the expansion depends on Einstein's eight ad hocs. In other words, that light travels through perfectly empty space. Nothing happens to it. it there's no redshift. It doesn't lose any energy. But we know that it loses energy. Remember, the cosmological mm -hmm. red redshift. So it does lose energy. And energy in this way is, is calculated as a matter and the motion of matter. In a way, I, you know, this is something new that I, I haven't really included elsewhere. Maybe it's in infinite universe theory. But I just think that to expect waves to reproduce themselves 100% perfectly, not going to happen. And that's where the energy is lost. So, and the only way it can go is to have longer wavelengths. That's what we're seeing with the cosmological redshift. And so uh, that that is, uh, so now as far as energy, I think this fellow is talking about energy simply, is energy, energy, energy can't make anything. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah energy can't already, make stuff. See, the universe is already there. It's infinite and it's moving around and so on. We're calculating the energy and so on. So, but remember, that's what where dark energy was invented. It was invented to have enough motion to produce the big bang you see and the big bang uh the universe is not expanding and that you have to read infinite universe theory to understand that more thoroughly but that's the position that we get when we find out that light uh actually does get tired over distance and does lose energy over this this is the facts these are not but why it does that that's that's where we get into a debate with the conventional physics yeah, I think one of the the things, though, too, um, I know you've talked about this and, and a disagreement, but we've had a couple of papers at, at, the, at our conference that talk about, you know, in the beginning, dark matter started from this idea that at the edge of the galaxies, um, uh, stars were going at the wrong speed. 
and that the only way that could be calculated is if you calculated using Newton or Kepler, it doesn't work. Well, it turns out that what they were doing was treating the, the gravitational field of the um, galaxy as a sphere, and it's not. And not only that, I did a video on a spherical galaxy. And they, they, you know what they say about a spherical galaxy? It doesn't have any dark matter. Well, the reason it doesn't is because all the stars are calculable because the gravitational field around it is, in fact, uniform. Whereas if you have, if we know for a fact, if you try to put a, a, something in orbit around a potato-like asteroid, you're not going around a sphere. It's not a spherical uh, gravity, right? I mean, you can, it, it would be like saying the Earth and the moon at a distance is the same as one. No, you, you, we know very much about that. So the, a lot of us who have looked at this, there is no not only not dark energy, dark matter, of course, there's not dark energy because, you know, there's no such thing as energy. But I think that was one of the things that, that um, I thought was interesting yeah. that I don't know if you had uh, seen those papers where you can describe, you know, describe the, all of these things with Newtonian mechanics or, you know, like neo-mechanics. Um, let me see. Again, uh, yes, I have Ian. Uh, Ian wants to come up and say hello. Uh, he's a regular here. Um, he comes hello, in. Ian. <laughs> there he is. Hello, Glenn. Yeah. There he is. All right. I love to see you. Good to see you as well. And yeah. thank you very much for the stimulating um, exposition. Uh, I have a few comments, which perhaps I'll just roll into, into one, uh, just for the purposes of time. And you might care to address some of them, Glenn. Um, Actually, I'm rather sympathetic to most of your views. I mean, uh, and David has expressed them as well about the universe being everything. And therefore, um, you know, it's nonsense to talk about something outside of it. Um, one might even uh, define nature uh, to be everything. And, and therefore, um, things like the supernatural and the natural are just really one. Um, the supernatural is something that we uh, talk about that, that we haven't yet uh, obtained a, a natural explanation for. Um, and the tired light business that you were talking about just now, uh, I, I, I accede to that as well. I agree. I mean, um, in a system where you have no uh, resistance, uh, Newton's first law will apply. You know, if you had no atmosphere at all, well, then, a, a, or no friction, you would have an object going right. on forever yeah but obviously uh, this is not true and and uh, the the paradox actually which i think you perhaps hinted at was that hubble uh, himself who who was given the arch um, responsibility for denying uh, th this actually uh, made this point it, it, it was his first right. explanation for it you know they never believed the universe was expanding yeah, yes, quite so. And they say oh, in 1929 or something, it was just, you know, uh, one thing which, which, was, which was put into his, his uh, proposition that the, there was a, a roughly linear relationship between the redshift and distances. Mm -hmm. um, now, j just maybe one or two quick questions um, before I leave it, Glenn. Um, mm -hmm. One is, I think you said towards the beginning of, of the talk that uh, older galaxies are not necessarily... Um, further away now, now i can understand that if one uh, as you and i do for example younger, one, younger ones check the expansion of the universe and the big bang yeah. and so on uh, that element comes into play but i mean because of the um the the time el elapse in the tra tra travel of light surely um we are looking at things further back the further we we are away and right. my second question if i may just roll it in is um it's actually a bit of a philosophical question. Um, I, I do work on the, the basis uh, that the universe is, is infinite in, in extent, right, yeah. and so uh, a time. But how would you address uh, the, the, the question which is frequently put, that if, if, if it were um, infinite in time, how could it ever have evolved to the present time? Because there's an infinite amount of time between the present and, you know, going right back. Well, that's a good question. Uh, and you know, you see a lot of recycling. Uh, for example, in the galaxy, we have uh, in the so-called empty space that Einstein was, didn't really know about at that time, uh, a lot of hydrogen, uh, there's helium, and there's tons of other things. You know, like there's gold, platinum, uranium, all these elements, you know, from supernova explosions and so on. Those had to occur 
long time ago. You know, it takes a long time for, and they're, they're ubiquitous throughout the galaxy as far as we can tell. And I'm sure between the intergalactic regions, there'll be stuff too. Now, every portion, everything in the universe has a beginning and an end, okay? In everything, every separate portion, XYZ portion, like you and I, we have a beginning, we have an end, and the earth has a beginning and have an end, and the galaxy likewise. And that's kind of interesting. I used to think there was some one uh, microcosm that continually recycled. But I don't think there's any evidence for that. that it's true that a lot of the galaxies look very similar. And by the way, uh, when you mentioned about uh, the actual uh, thing is that spiral galaxies are seen out 13 billion light years. Spiral galaxies like ours, ours took 13 billion years to form. So what that means is light from those uh, galaxies that, that we, the Hubble telescope sees uh, 13 billion light years away, that light took 13 billion years to get here. So at the bare minimum, the universe would have to be 26 billion light, uh, 26 billion years old. And of course it's infinite, so you can go on with this all you want, but uh, that's uh, just a simple thing. Now, when we get the Webb telescope, that's going to go up one of these days, we're gonna see even more universe. And then you're gonna to have to recalculate, it won't be 13.7, or 13.8 billion anymore, they'll have to add more to it because the, the universe is infinite. We're never gonna see, we can't prove directly that the universe is infinite. You know, we, we can only assume that. And I'm telling you, if you read Infinite Universe Theory, the, that assumption works wonderfully. Oh, oh, okay, th th thank you very much. But there's perhaps just one um, philosophical explanation uh, which people find it hard to grasp. You know, wh wh why should we be in the present now rather than in any other period of time in the infinite past? I, I think people, you know, grapple with that um, philosophical concept. Well, of course, there are people, pe I don't know, beings living on other planets in the universe. Remember, there's 400 billion stars in the Milky Way alone. And then there's two trillion galaxies in the universe that we can see. Wow. And you could be on any one of these galaxies. You know, you would be looking different because it's a different planet, perhaps, and so on. But uh, that just happens to be. We happen to be. We're, we're, not, we're nothing special, in other words. You might say, well, why are we here at this time? And so on. Well, we aren't special. There, there, there are trillions of living beings in the universe. And they aren't all on the earth. It's rather likely, yes, because of the sheer number. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, th thank you very much, uh, Glenn. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for asking questions. Yeah, no, that's great. Ian's a, a really great mind. I, I enjoy bringing him on. He also yeah, saves he me once in a while. Well, save me once in a while because people are shy, and he he's there's nothing shy about him. But uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think the other thing that's really really mind blowing to people it was to me when I first heard it. But I believe it a hundred percent. Is there no two two things are no two things are the same, right? Not even no right. two electrons. No, two, if you're an etherist, no two etherist particles. Right. Whatever it is, nothing is the same, and that that just it, it doesn't jibe well with with people. And when was that something that that you got from a, another philosopher, or was that something that you came up in your own work? I, I, it was in my own work. I remember I invented the Simon coefficient, the similarity coefficient for doing volcanic ash correlations. What we would do from volcanoes such as the one that was at Mount Mazama, Crater Lake in Oregon, uh, right. we would look at the volcanic ash and determine, tw we put the samples in the nuclear reactor. That's my physics background. We use a nuclear reactor to make these samples radioactive and we would be able to measure all these trace elements and we could compare them and what uh, people were using for comparisons weren't quite right. So I invented this equation, which actually uh, essentially said, okay, if something's perfectly identical, it gives you a value of 1.00. And if it's perfectly different, it gives you a value of 0, 0.00. None of the analyses I ever had comparing anything with anything else ever came close to 1.00. And the closest we could get, take two samples from the same volcano, we would get 0.95. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we would now some people have improved the methods and they could get closer to 0 0.98, but you never get to point, uh, you know, 1.00. And that's because no two things in the universe are identical. And remember the snowflake thing is probably a, a really good example of that. And people I still think, I think part of it, here's, here's something before I forget it. I think what people do with the snowflake one is this, let's just look at it this way. They're going to look at a top. It's made from what, uh, oxygen and hydrogen i mean Water, yeah. h2o, h2o right yeah. so let's just say let's just say they go down to that part of the that mm -hmm. level of the universe only then they're going to say okay there's this many atoms that we can fit in this sort of space and therefore the combinatorics of those are going to be this way there's some sort of rules that they do it and they come to the conclusion you could probably come come up with some equation that would give you the those what you would say would be all the combinatorics of that, right? It'd be a, yeah, human, that, yeah. a human. But the problem with that is, is that the atoms themselves, the electrons, the nucleons, whatever you call, whatever happens, those little pieces down below, those aren't equal either. And so in reality, if you you could calculate the all the combinatorics and believe in your mind that that those are the number of, of those things are finite. It's sort of like a Legos, right? You can put Legos right. together in so many ways. But the problem even with Legos is that the, the pieces of those are different and, and are changing all the time. Right. So, yeah. so if you look at the, the snowflake, even though you can come up with the combinatorics of the building blocks at the atomic level, I'm sorry, you lose because every atom is a different size. So you're never going to be able to do it. Uh, using and that's a really good example of the infinite uh, universe theory, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's a remember I was mentioning that uh, an electron has ten to that twenty, you know, trillions and tr time, trillions of of um, ether particles in one electron. Mm -hmm. Now you're trying to tell me that oh, you have a snowflake that's identical. You also have to tell me that the orientation of each of the water molecules has to be identical for two right. to be the same. And also you right. have to tell me that there's no water in the surroundings that continually enters the snowflake and goes out. We all know that. You know what happens to a beautiful sure. snowflake within minutes, it can just kind of collapse. And so that's what happens. And there's is there an environment that in which a snowflake could exist? That ha can that environment, that macrocosm, not have any water in it? I don't think right. so. Right, right. Not possible. Right. Here's, here's, um, uh, uh, whoops. Oh, this is good. I wasn't supposed to put this up. I was missed it. This is a good, intelligent people. Oh, that like, I just want to put that up for you. I, the yeah, intelligent well, part, you know. I always appreciate that. Yes. You know? Yeah. We, okay. So, you know, we're on the, we're on the extreme fringe of what is considered right in, in physics. And so it's always great to have comments like that. Yeah, no, I put that up there just to, you know, uh, it's it's very true. That's why I'm having you on here, because your work is, is phenomenal. Here, Here's an interesting question. Does Glenn think endless means the same as infinite? Well, I suppose. I don't know what you mean endless of. That's sort of of a thing. So, but remember, uh, there, there can't be any end to the universe, because it's sort of like, remember the old days when they were talking about, well, the Earth is flat and uh, you'll eventually hit dragons there or something. We're, we're not at that stage where we're finally going to realize the universe is infinite. And when there's, there's nothing at the end of endless. There's nothing at the end of the universe. Yes. The universe just goes on. It's not possible. Just think yeah. about it. Be logical. It can't end anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the part of it is I always thought if it did, you get to the end, you would fall apart because you're if 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 you if you are the make making up of all the microcosms below you, keeping you what you are for the time you are, the in the motion that keeps you where you are. Yeah. If you get to a place where the, these things are no longer there, these things will you know things will break down. The same thing would happen inside of you if for some reason sure. there was an edge to it. That's so, why yeah. environment is so important because you environment always says there's a microcosm and a macrocosm right. there's always a macrocosm so you can't go to the end, end of the universe and find empty space it's not possible there's right. always space there's that space is always filled with matter okay i have uh, anybody else in the green room here because i do see nick percival did you want to come on and say hello or if not how about james keen you're there as well if you do want to say something uh you'll need to uh I don't hear any microphones from uh, James Keene. Did you want to come on and say anything or you're good? No, I think he looks good. He's cool. 
Um, and uh, Nick, I don't know. Did you want to come on and see? Wave your hand if you want to want to say. Okay, I need you to get you off your mute because you're unmuted, but nothing's coming out of your your uh, microphone. We're not hearing you because you we. So you're going to have to get your uh, check on your computer there. Um, it says, sorry about that, Nick. Uh, give it a shot. I mean, I'll bring you up. If I bring you up, you're not going. We're not going to hear you. So let me see. Say say something. One two three. One, two, three. Oh, there, three. Hey, oh, there he is. How there we got doing? him. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great to have you, Nick. Yeah. It's it's very interesting. I After I graduated from Harvard with a degree in physics, and for some time after that, my only inputs were uh, mainstream mainstream physics. Right. That's the only thing I ever heard of. In fact, uh, they taught me special relativity, but didn't even mention the twin paradox. There was no hint that anybody in the entire world had ever questioned relativity. So for a long time, seeing rather obvious problems with uh, special relativity, I just studied this on my own because I just said, hey, I can understand physics and math. I've always done that, but I don't understand this. So I spent many decades um, in the dark thinking about it and came up and I, w I wasn't trying to be philosophical. I came up with much of the same um, conclusions that you did without even trying great, to yeah. be a philosopher. It just, it's great you know, we're on the same page there. Yeah, but I do have a few comments about uh, maybe the use of words because one can say one thing and the listener can hear something else. So I'll start off with a simple example. Uh, you were talking about free will. And I agree, I'm in the same camp of you regarding uh, determinism and causality. So I think everyone has free will, but I came to the conclusion that if you stand before something and trying to choose ver good versus evil, your decision must be predetermined. You don't, it doesn't hang in the balance. There's no yeah. choice that's made at that. You have your decision. own idea. It's, oh, it's yeah. predetermined. Right. And years later, I found that uh, Bertrand Russell had come to the same conclusion and he stated it as free will requires predetermination. Because if you choose something that's out of, that's not predictable from your current state, then that means something is getting in the way of your choosing what's, what's your will to choose. So there is free will, but it require it's different than what everyone kind of has yeah. a, thinks of as free will. Yeah, a lot of people have done that and they have different definitions for free will and so on. And there's what they call compatibilists or whatever. Uh, and they have mine is very simple. It's I'm I'm just an old farm kid, and uh, everything has a, a cause, and that that would involve everything in my brain. So that's pretty simple. Uh, you can never prove this, of course. And the debates go on forever. I remember I was in college, and we used to have dorm debates about, and the scientists would be anti free will. And then the social guys, socialists, uh, social sociology guys were in the free will, free will stuff, except for the psychologists. The psychologists, it's interesting. They're very much into uh, determinism. They're not into free will. So I just find it, it's sort of an interminable debate. And, uh, you know, I, I don't find it useful to talk about it. Right. right. The word, yeah, I would just bring up that the word can mean different things. Oh, yeah, right, right. Some people think it's an illusion. Yeah. I don't know what an illusion is. That's magic for me. And so uh, I just use straight old determinism and causes effects. And yeah. sorry, that's just the way I am. Now, you, we talked about space time, and this is an area that I've studied for 50 years. So I wanted to make a comment. I think where Einstein went wrong was in this, his second principle, namely that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames. And as a result of that, that necessitated um, 
coming up with this concept of space time, which is yeah. a step and dil backwards. dilation and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay. Um, at first, when you when I saw your third assumption, um, I'm forgetting what what was the name of the th third oh, assumption. Uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty. Yeah. I thought, oh, gee, this is contradictory to one and two, but. Uh, I think a different phrase would be helpful. I think what you really were talking about was uncertainty of measurability. Yeah. You were, I don't think you were endorsing a probabilistic oh, no. universe. No, just yeah. how you calculate probability. You need to use probability for the stuff you don't know. Yeah, I would change it. I would expand on it and say uncertainty of measurement because I no, think... It, there's nothing certain in, in any case. <laughs> Well, is it probabilistic? Uh, what, pro what is probabilistic? Pro is a measurement. That's all that is. See, you're measuring well, in, the in, within the context of uh, quantum mechanics, but um, of anything, all of it has plus or minus. I give that all the time when I do a measurement. Yeah, but it, but determinism says that what's going to happen is certain. Okay, you're talking about uh, what is it, Laplace's demon? But that's based on finite causality. Finite universal causality is what is used in classical mechanics. And this is neomechanics. We don't do that. We don't use that. We don't claim to be able to detect or predict anything within 100% accuracy. And, of course, uh, the, the classical mechanists are, are uh, criticized for claiming that. And we don't claim that. We claim there's always a plus or minus. So, right, okay. right. But determinism to me says okay the outcome is certain oh yeah but okay. we can we can never predict it or measure it because we don't have enough information because there's too right. many variables right. well I, that's why i would say uncertainty of of measurement but that's well, just my answer just my thought a different uh, well de remember deter what that means uh, uh make? well deter is part of determinism right so so right. if something's deterred uh it is uh, it's going to uh, collide with something else. And so that means uh, that's that's another uh, little uh, bit about what the meaning of determinism is to me. Okay. Um, regarding, you put down relativism versus absolutism. And I think a lot of listeners will say you're endorsing Einstein's relativity. <laughs> uh, no. So I think I think another phrase would be helpful because, you know, from GPS, the data says that there is absolute motion and rest locally with respect to certain uh, physics phenomenon that can be taught to find. Um, uh, how do they say that? Uh, um, uh, oh dear. Defined in absolute physic physics terms, so uh, I think you get away from <laughs> endorsing relativity. You might say uh, uh, nothing is I identical. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. That that's what rel that's how I explain it actually uh, in ten right. assumptions. Yeah, well, I, th I think too. I think too, Nick. What what's happening is we can redefine and use that word correctly, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's yeah. totally divorced from from Einstein's relativity, and yeah. so yeah. But um, I'm going to step in here. But I do want to say for everyone that um, if you haven't checked it out, uh, you can check out Nick. Uh, he's got his, uh, let me put it here. You have his, uh, channel, which you have over 200 subscribers now, Nick, yeah. you need to make some more. I mean, you, you put that out there, but if you haven't, uh, 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 watched uh, and, and talked with Nick. In fact, I may uh, have him on as a, a person. We should uh, think about doing that, Nick, and talk about your work. But if you want, he has a great lecture series on uh, relativity, special relativity, um, at nickatime.guru. Uh, uh, his web, his channel. He's got over, you know, 200 subscribers. He had put up something. I think just in a couple of years ago, he put a, quite a few stuff uh, things up there. So you want to check that out. So thank you very much, Nick. It was great to have I, you on I'd here. I'd like to make one controversial remark, and that is, I don't think anything that I've heard from Glenn requires 
infinity. It requires large beyond human ability to count, <laughs> but not necessarily in infinity per se. So that's just something to think about. Okay. All right. Yep. Well, yeah. Thank you so how much. How you do it? <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you for, very much, uh, Nick. I really appreciate it. Um, I, th you know, we're, we've already gone over, but I, I'm letting it go because things have been going uh, quite well. But I think what we'll do now is um, we're going to wrap this up. And f what what I want to uh, remind everybody is that you're going to be back in a couple of weeks, right? Uh, to talk about sure. specifically the Big Bang. Now, it, it, it turns out that a lot of the, uh, how do you say, fighting that goes on in, in, with critical thinkers and mainstream science has been around the Big Bang. And it's been going on for quite a while. And um, what we want to do is, I don't want to say, say a whole lot, but um, you came across and talk about the Big Bang quite a bit. Uh, what, what what was one of the reasons you uh, sort of use that? Uh, obviously, there's relativity, but the Big Bang. What was? How did you just give us a brief summary before we uh, come on next time? Two weeks from now, I think it's two weeks from now, and talk about the Big Bang. How did you get involved in the Big Bang? Why did you see that as an important thing in your philosophical work? Just give us a short version here because we're going to be going. <laughs> Very short. I think I, I was a big banger in 78. and uh, Really? Yeah, I was a big banger because I believed, you know, science, you know, that's supposedly science. I hadn't studied it, right? Right, right. And like a lot of us, so you didn't look into it. And why would a little farm kid like me uh, ever know anything about that? And uh, <laughs> So, so then I tried to, I actually, this is what I tried to do. I, I remember they said the universe is expanding. And then I said, okay, well, if that's true, some of the parts of the universe are giving off light and maybe that light crashes somewhere between the two things and bingo, <laughs> we, have, we have a continuing universe. So right. I was always trying to, to figure it out. And then finally I just said, this, this is nuts. How can anything, uh, you know, it's anti-creationism. Uh, is, how can anything explode out of nothing? So. Yeah. So, so, so one of the things I'm going to talk about is that when you make something, you bring things together. Right. The Big Bang is bringing things apart. That's another uh, silly thing right. that I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do. Right. Right. Well, listen, folks, I want to first of all, I want to thank you, Glenn, for coming on. Uh, there's a whole new audience out there, and I felt very, nece ve very necessary to have you out. It's also good to see people like, you know, Nick and Ian and other people who have been around a little bit. My father as well. Um, you do have a history within the dissident community, which is quite um, uh, strong. Uh, you've changed. I know you were out there when I first met you in the early 2000s at the, C the NPA conferences, really out there evangelizing in some sense the idea of, first of all, philosophy and the use of our words and the use of what those things mean in the philosophical meaning. And so, I mean, in my opinion, you've, uh, like I said, you don't need to do anything else uh, in your life because you've given us quite a, a great body of work and put a lot of things together. I think the other thing Thing too that impresses me so much is your basis in philosophy as well. Um, today and age, you don't have to have a degree in it because if to me, I don't care. Uh, I in my movie, I say it. It took me eight years in my movie to come up with with this phrase. Don't tell. Uh, um, I don't know what. It, I don't know. I don't. Let's see. It's not who you are. It's what you say. And so, right. and, and that, and that's really what it comes down to. To me, I don't care if you're a janitor working somewhere and you say amazing things or whether you have a PhD uh, from MIT. Um, I think it's most important to what you've given the world. You've spent a lot of time for a farm boy on this stuff. And we really, uh, I want to thank you uh, very much. And um, it's a good thing you're around. And I do want to put one thing in your head uh, I would like you to think about seriously because we are starting to put together, we have real online software that are the CM MPS is licensing. It's not a whole lot. It's a couple hundred dollars a year, but it, that allows you to teach. 
Now, I know mm-hmm. it's not so easy for you to go to your local college and teach even what you're teaching because, it, you know, it will fly in the face of a lot of, of, of things that people are supposedly are the truths. But I'd love to th- have you think about it seriously to put together a course. It's very easy sure. to do online. It's called Learn Dash. It, Learn Dash is made to make courses they are quite easy. You can make videos and um, you can put, has quizzes, you can have tests, you can have all those Sounds kinds good. of things. Sounds good. Send and me the can, link. I'd like yes, to Yes, I that. will. Yeah, and so, so I, I, I would, I just think that's what you need to do to the world because you're, it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another one, another thing to have you teach. And today in age, I don't know if you know, but universities, all the best ones in the world are doing it online. And sure. some of them are doing better online than they are doing in person. The world's going that way. So yeah. I would, I'd really like you to consider, but thank you so much for taking yeah. your time. It was very early and we look forward to talking on the Big Bang. If you want to prepare something, you can. If not, let me know. We'll have a, we'll have a million questions. And I want to thank everybody who's uh, tuned in again. So um, I'm going to uh, leave you and put on our and uh, wrap this up. So thank you very much, uh, yeah. and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And thank you. It's uh, really great, and I'm I'm really happy to talk to people who actually understand some of this stuff, <laughs> like <Yeah>. you. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is and frustrating. I, and, and, for, and Nick, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, there's a lot of people who admire you quite a bit. And I did, um, I, I do see some people who are new to, don't really know about all of us in the, the MPA and CMPS who are new, very yeah. new to critical thinking. And the comments in the comment areas have been uh, quite good. He says, I, I'm, I'm new here, but uh, this is great. So yeah. you're getting a whole new generation. And, and, and so you heard it here, folks. It's recorded yeah. for prosperity that he says he's going to look into do, to doing a course. Yeah. And I think that would be really, really good. So thank you so much once again. Okay. And so uh, everybody should read Infinite Universe Theory so they can get a uh, head yes. start on our next uh, little. Oh, yes. Yeah. So let me, yeah, I, I will put that up there. Um, Right here, I'll put it here. Uh, if you put in infinite universe theory, uh, you'll whoops. find it on Amazon. Right there. There you go. Yeah. Yep. And you can put it in there and you can actually get it for six bucks, I think, too, there, as well, an ebook. Yeah. Uh, about, I think, nine ninety nine. they always want. And then you can get a color paperback and a black and white paperback. And right, you, right. You choose what you like. Yeah, and I think this is really good because this book, and the reason we didn't talk about it, it, it ju- uh, justifiably is because this is so linked to the, uh, there's a lot about the Big Bang, and so we'll be talking about it. So I urge everybody, you have two weeks before uh, you uh, we're going to have him back. So if you read it, you're going to be a lot more uh, in, informed, of course. You can have good questions for him. Again, you can also uh, talk with us. But uh, uh, again, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Glenn, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for coming. All right. All right. Okay, folks, That's that wraps it up for today. I want to thank everybody. Again, all my uh, subscribers on Dissident Science uh, on YouTube. I want to thank all the members of the CMPS for their support, all the people who are here during the 12 years we've been doing this Saturday morning uh, broadcast. Uh, and I want to thank Franklin Hugh again for all the many, year, many years he has been working on this. Uh, I've been uh, here in the in the past. And uh, again, if you want to support us and uh, and help us out, you can go to our websites, uh, naturalphilosophy.org. You can sign up, become a member, and you can actually uh, help pay as little as $35 a year to keep this going because it's, it's us that gets support. We don't have any university or corporate sponsors. If you want to read more about uh, people who are in the dissonant world, you can in more of a, a easy reading, sort of a magazine, you can go to sciencewoke.org. And of course, um, our two YouTube channels at youtube.philosophy.org. There's a lot of great videos like this on that channel. And also, I have a lot of uh, YouTube, uh, almost 250 YouTube cha- uh, videos as well on dissident science. And um, I'm going to take you out with our stinger here from that. that um, it works for next year, uh, next week, too. And want to thank again Glenn Borkert for uh, uh, his participation. You'll see him in two weeks. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to play a few things here, a little bit of advertisement for our organization and what's coming up.
and a little bit about our organization, the CNPS. folks. Remember, I'm David D. Hilser. I'm your science therapist trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a critical thinker. Stay thinking, stay critical. Ciao for now.